He sits slumped in a hoodie three sizes bigger than his interest in the guest speaker visiting his classroom. He is part of a quote unquote tough class that hasn't much in the way of motivation. Do not take it personally if you don't get anything out of them, both the teacher and the clock tell me it is Thursday, 8.30, and I begin the way I always do. How many of you dislike poetry, I ask? I receive the standard answer, about half, and certainly more hands would have been raised, but energy is not a prerequisite. He does not lift his arm nor his eyelids. As I begin to speak, I introduce myself. My name is Holly Painter. Half teacher, half poet, part artist, part instructor, and while my surname suggests paint and palettes may have hung from my family tree, I'm just beginning to realize why the name painter never quite sounds right. You see, I prefer poetry. This does the trick for a few of them. A boy in the back eagerly asks if I'm a rapper, and while I desperately wish I could tell him yes, I stick to the truth. In the next 60 minutes, I invite them to speak theirs too. I begin by unapologetically sharing with them poems about my life what the view is like from inside a closet, what happens when parents split at the seams about discovering poetry slams and finally finding a way to speak, and then I pass out full scat. I tell them they can write about whatever they want. There are still a few students with stares as blank as the line sheets I have offered them, but this workshop does not have a rubric, and I know better than most that sometimes showing up is the best we can do. As I circulate the fluorescent room, a girl twirling a rainbow bracelet around her finger says her best friend would probably enjoy my poems. I see equal love scratched as a title at the top of her page. A boy sitting next to the condensation stained window says he and his friends gather outside in circles and spit bars. He says the teachers assume they are doing drugs. I introduce him to the word cipher and he shyly shows me a notebook overflowing with his rhymes. The girl behind him Eyeliner as thick as the armor I imagine she wears underneath her pink sweatshirt says my parents divorced too when I was only nine and sometimes I wish things were different. Miss, I don't know how to start a poem. I tell her, I think she just did. I make my way over to the hunched pile of sweatshirt I will come to know as Dylan. For a moment, I think he has fallen asleep. I steel myself so as not to be offended. Tapping lightly on his desk, he raises his head high enough for me to see he has filled three sheets in the span of 20 minutes. I ask him what he has written about, and he says his poem is for his brother. I learn his and mine both share the same name, but when I excitedly present him with this bit of information, his eyes do not hold my smile. Dylan tells me his brother was hit by a car while riding his bike that sidewalks are not safe enough places for vehicles that jump curbs, how the driver had the nerve not even to stop, how his family has made a second home out of a hospital room, how he hopes his little brother will wake up out of the coma so he can show him the poems he has written him late at night. Recent headlines flash behind my eyes as he speaks Dylan's poem. To be honest, I do not remember incredibly clearly, but I know that when he decides to share it aloud with the rest of the class, it is so beautiful and honest, it sucks the breath out of the entire room in the most incredible way. As he moves towards the hall after the bell rings, Dylan places a hand on my shoulder and says, thank you for bringing that out of me today. I tell him he does not need to thank me, that his bravery stands alone, and that he must remember always that he does not. He shuffles into the sea of students, and I am left holding his story in my lungs. It is Thursday, 9.30 and I leave the way I frequently do, speechless, which for a poet says a lot. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Holly Painter. Um, I'm a spoken word artist, a public speaker, and a certified teacher, um, and I have kind of the best job in the entire world. Um, I get to travel around the province and introduce students to and work with them through the creation of spoken word poetry. Um, I can remember distinctly the conversation I had with my parents when I said I was going to leave supply teaching to be a poet. Uh, luckily, <laughs> exactly, there was that silence and then like a, huh, oh, okay. Um, but luckily it's all worked out and so I, I I am amazed all the time uh, to have this job and blessed to have this job as a full-time artist educator and to see young people using poetry as a way to express themselves, as a way to be emotional and vulnerable and empathetic with each other in classroom environments that don't always allow or invite them to do so. Uh, I once had a conversation with a teacher and she said, while she enjoyed the concept of spoken word poetry and incorporating it into her English curriculum, the personal lives of her students were none of her business. 
I didn't say a whole lot at the time, but if I could go back and have that conversation with her again, I would ask her how it's possible to separate student and learning from person and life. I have a bias, obviously, to spoken word, but to be able to go into classrooms and see young people welcoming the opportunity to navigate and narrate their own identities and to bring their own stories to the classroom stage or to the poetry slam stage has been absolutely incredible. Um, I think a lot about the ways in which students are invited to share their identities and to share their stories in classrooms, whether they're able to do that. I only see a glimpse as a spoken word artist or as a, as a workshop facilitator. But I think a lot about how we can be better at structuring learning and structuring learning environments so that it's more conducive for us to do that. Um, and that not only do we welcome student voice and, and student stories to, to be present in our classrooms, but to value and respect them uh, when they do so. So I introduce students to spoken word poetry. I use the mottos of speak your truth and show the love. And I see it over and over and over again. That poem that I just shared with you is just one example of one workshop that I facilitated, but this happens over and over and over and over again, watching young people have their say on their own story. So I guess today I think I come with the question of how can we be better in doing that, not only by incorporating spoken word poetry into English curriculums, but other things that can help facilitate this conversation. And when I start thinking about that, I also start thinking about how we as uh, educators or adults consciously or unconsciously impose our own identities on students or our own identities on the young people that we work with. And sometimes these moments happen, they're so minuscule, we don't even realize that we're doing it, that we impose these ideas of what, who a student is or what they can be on them. And it sort of stifles young people's ability to be able to know and narrate and navigate and learn themselves. Um, I suppose the best way to give you an example of this is to tell you a story. Um, well, to share a poem, obviously. <laughs> this poem is called Butterfly Boy. The halls were all but silent. A faint squeak of sneakers greeted me at the door. A sign read, visitors must report to the office. I could have been in any school in the country. Telephone perched between shoulder and chin. The secretary glanced casually in my direction. Continuing her percussive keyboard clicks as if lives depended on it, so I turned my attention to the artwork adorning the school entrance. The foyer filled with pink and blue traces of splayed fingers on construction paper, each child's name scratched haphazardly in crayon on the colored sheet he or she had been assigned. I was met by the silent applause of kindergartners, yet couldn't put a finger on why I felt unsettled. Returning to the receptionist, I began to introduce myself, but was quickly interrupted by two enthusiastic students bouncing into the room, attendance sheets gripped fiercely in their palms, holding onto their responsibility for dear life. They grinned widely as they handed her the papers, and she smiled back and offered them stickers as thanks. The brown-haired girl and the brown-eyed boy both reached for their prize, and I watched as the boy's eyes drifted from his truck sticker to the little girl's butterfly. Can I have that one instead, he said, Almost inaudibly, an uncertainty caught in his throat, and the way the secretary thrust the truck forward, I doubted for a second she had even heard him speak, he repeated. Why can't I have a butterfly? I waited for her answer with the same bated breath as the boy, hoping she would think twice or 20 times about her next line, wanting more than anything to grab him in his blanket of innocence and run away. Butterflies are for girls, she said. So strongly, I thought maybe she had been fact-checking this when I came in, her conviction. <laughs> Her conviction left both of us silent. He accepted her ignorance and left, his head hanging down towards the floor, no doubt heavy with the weight of the new knowledge he possessed. I wish I had said something. To this day, I imagine him, returning home from school that night, dropping his backpack and naivety at his bedroom door, staring at the mason jars lining his bookshelves that he had collected for when he netted the most beautiful specimens, he would have captured them in amazement then released them when his kind heart reminded him that they deserved to be free and Shouldn't he be free to love butterflies or anything else on this earth, not cocooning his heart against beautiful things because the rules of pinks and blues choose what it is we can fall for? My dear butterfly boy, I hope that wherever you are today, you have learned how to deal with people with faces full of preconceived notions, masking as concern.
I hope you tell them this is not the way things have to be. I hope you live in a conservatory surrounded by the symmetrical rainbow bodies you think are gorgeous. Better yet, I hope you wear your love of butterflies proudly on your chest the way other men slip on sweaters of sports teams. And I hope if anyone questions what is wrong with you, that you return the question back like a package misdelivered and ask, why do we clip the wings of our brown-haired girls and our brown-eyed boys? Why are the souls of those who love freely crushed into insect dust beneath the souls of those who can't think outside the box? My dear butterfly boy, I hope that whatever you have bloomed into is full of beauty and that your heart still loves with no restrictions. And most of all, I hope that someday a person like me could enter any school in the country and see a boy like you asking the question again. And the only answer he'll receive is, of course, you can. Thank you. It's really fortunate for you that TEDx has a time limit because I could l literally talk forever and the people who know me know that I can talk forever about spoken word and as cliche as it sounds, how it has absolutely transformed my life, um, not only as a person, but as an educator as well. And so I suppose there, there's limitless conversation that we could have around identity and bringing ability, the ability for youth to speak on their own lives into classrooms. And we can have those conversations out in the hallway later if you want. But I think if nothing else today, uh, my talk, I suppose I would like to just have it serve as a little spark or a little seed. If you've never heard of this thing called spoken word poetry before, um, check it out because it kind of has a big impact. So uh, if I haven't already convinced you to Google that when you go home. <laughs> I've got one more thing to say. This, this is a PSA, a poetic solution to apathy. This is proof that youth have a lot to say if you just give them the chance to do so. If you think young people are lethargic, lazy or listless, dispassionate, disinterested, insensitive or indifferent, I'll have to politely and poetically disagree because I have seen heads down on desks become quests for poetic supremacy have seen words slung like swords slice through the thickest insecurity. I've heard incredible stories of strength presented to rooms in beautiful metaphors and similes. I've watched clicks dissolve as the clicks of finger snaps give confidence to kids who have never been given respect from their peers until today. This is a PSA, a pen solving afflictions. You do not need to read a dictionary definition of youth to know it is difficult discovering who you are meant to be. Most of us need only to summon our own memories. Remember 16? Distress can amplify at rates far beyond even the volume of headphones. So if teens pick up a pen over another weapon to battle their demons, consider it a major victory. This is a PSA, a preoccupation saving adolescence. Don't think poems have much power? Ask me about the students who have used workshops to come out to their peers. Ask about the secrets they reveal that need to reach somebody's ears. Ask about the difficulties they're sharing well beyond their years. This is an outlet, a way to get out what's left buried in chests, so a way to speak on what goes on behind the scenes. But don't worry, it's not just a stream of narcissistic rhymes. It's youth finding their voices on more than just their own lives. This is a PSA, a performance stimulating advocacy. I have seen teens battle injustices both on and off the page, both on and off the stage, taking up causes after writing about this world needing change. This is not just a complaint fest on paper. This is testing them to write what's wrong, then write what's wrong. This is empowerment and inspiration rolled up into the ballpoint of a pen. This is a lesson in saying what you mean and acting on what you say. This is a PSA, a possession of self-assurance. I have witnessed kids hit growth spurts right before my eyes. Digesting so many poems, they grow backbones overnight. Watch as they discover courage they never knew they could possess. Stacks of paper become launching pads for newly soaring confidence, and all of this is accomplished while teaching them the literary basics. We deserve a spot in the curriculum with William, even though we're not as famous. This is a PSA, a powerful, significant activity. This is passion and compassion. This is a movement and a community. This is an art form changing lives. This is spoken word poetry. Thank you.